of Feanor and the unchaining of Melkor. Now the three kindreds of the Eldar were gathered at last in Valinor, and Melkor was chained. This was the noontide of the Blessed Realm, the fullness of its glory and its bliss, long in tale of years, but in memory too brief. In those days, the Eldar became full-grown in stature of body and of mind, and the Noldor advanced ever in skill and knowledge, and the long years were filled with their joyful labors, in which many new things, fair and wonderful, were devised. Then it was that the Noldor first bethought them of letters, and Rumil of Tyrion was the name of the lawmaster, who first achieved fitting signs for the recording of speech and song, some for graving upon metal or in stone, others for drawing with brush or with pen. In that time was born in Eldemar, in the house of the king, in Tyrion upon the crown of Tunar, the eldest of the sons of Finwë, and the most beloved. Kuru Finwë was his name. But by his mother he was called Feanor, spirit of fire, and thus he is remembered in all the tales of the Noldor. Miriel was the name of his mother who was called Serinda because of her surpassing skill in weaving and needlework. For her hands were more skilled to fineness than any hands even among the Noldor. The love of Finwë and Miriel was great and glad, for it began in the blessed realm in the days of bliss. But in the bearing of her son, Miriel was consumed in spirit and body, and after his birth, she yearned for release from the labor of living. And when she had named him, she said to Finwë, Never again shall I bear child, for strength that would have nourished the life of many has gone forth into Feanor. Then Finwë was grieved, for the Noldor were in the youth of their days, and he desired to bring forth many children into the bliss of Aman. And he said, Surely there is healing in Aman. Here all weariness can find rest. But when Miriel languished still, Finwë sought the counsel of Manwë, and Manwë delivered her to the care of Irmo in Lorien. At their parting, for a little while, as he thought, Finwë was sad, for it seemed an unhappy chance that the mother should depart and miss the beginning at least of the childhood days of her son. It is indeed unhappy, said Miriel. And I would weep, if I were not so weary. But hold me blameless in this, and in all that may come after. She went then to the gardens of Lorien, and lay down to sleep. But though she seemed to sleep, her spirit indeed departed from her body, and passed in silence to the halls of Mandos. The maidens of Este tended the body of Miriel, and it remained unwithered, but she did not return. Then Finwë lived in sorrow, and he went often to the gardens of Lorien, and sitting beneath the silver willows beside the body of his wife, he called her by her names. 
but it was unavailing. And alone in all the blessed realm, he was deprived of joy. After a while, he went to Lorien no more. All his love he gave thereafter to his son, and Feanor grew swiftly as if a secret fire were kindled within him. He was tall and fair of face and masterful, his eyes piercingly bright and his hair raven dark. In the pursuit of all, his purposes eager and steadfast. Few ever changed his course by counsel, none by force. He became of all the Noldor, then or after, the most subtle in mind and the most skilled in hand. In his youth, bettering the work of Rumil, he devised those letters which bear his name, and which the Eldar used ever after. And he it was who, first of the Noldor, discovered how gems greater and brighter than those of the earth might be made with skill. The first gems that Feanor made were white and colorless, that being set under starlight, they would blaze with blue and silver fires brighter than Helluin. And other crystals he made also, wherein things far away could be seen small but clear, as were the eyes of the eagles of Manwe. Seldom were the hands and mind of Feanor at rest. While still in his early youth, he wedded Nerdanel, the daughter of a great smith named Martan, among those of the Noldor most dear to Aula. And of Martan, he learned much of the making of things in metal and in stone. Nerdanel also was firm of will, but more patient than Feanor desiring to understand minds rather than to master them, and at first she restrained him when the fire of his heart grew too hot. But his later deeds grieved her, and they became estranged. Seven sons she bore to Feanor. Her mood she bequeathed in part to some of them, but not to all. Now it came to pass that Finwë took as his second wife Indis the Fair, she was a Vanya, close kin of Ingwe the High King, golden-haired and tall, and in all ways unlike Miriel. Finwë loved her greatly and was glad again. But the shadow of Miriel did not depart from the house of Finwë, nor from his heart. And of all whom he loved, Feanor had ever the chief share of his thought. The wedding of his father was not pleasing to Feanor, and he had no great love for Indis, nor for Fingolfin and Finarfin, her sons. He lived apart from them, exploring the land of Ammon, or busying himself with the knowledge and the crafts in which he delighted. In those unhappy things which later came to pass, and in which Feanor was the leader, many saw the effect of this breach within the house of Finwë. Judging that if Fenwë had endured his loss and been content with the fathering of his mighty son, the courses of Feanor would have been otherwise, and great evil might have been prevented. For the sorrow and the strife in the house of Fenwë is graven in the memory of the Noldorin elves. But the children of Indis were great and glorious, and their children also, and if they had not lived, the history of the Eldar would have been diminished. Now even while Feanor and the craftsmen of the Noldor worked with delight, foreseeing no end to their labors, and while the sons of Indis grew to their full stature, the noontide of Valinor was drawing to its close. For it came to pass that Melkor, as the Valar had decreed, completed the term of his bondage, dwelling for three ages in the duress of Mandos alone. At length, as Manwë had promised, he was brought again before the thrones of the Valar. Then he looked upon the glory and their bliss, and envy was in his heart. He looked upon the children of Ilovata that sat at the feet of the mighty, and hatred filled him. He looked upon the wealth of bright gems, and he lusted for them. But he hid his thoughts, and postponed his vengeance. Before the gates of Valmar, Melkor abased himself at the feet of Manwë and sued for pardon, vowing that if he might be made only the least of the free people of Valinor, he would aid the Valar in all their works, and most of all, in the healing of the many hurts that he had done to the world. And Nienna aided his prayer. 
but Mandos was silent. Then Manwe granted him pardon. But the Valar would not yet suffer him to depart beyond their sight and vigilance, and he was constrained to dwell within the gates of Valmar. But fair-seeming were all the words and deeds of Melkor in that time, and both the Valar and the Eldar had profit from his aid and counsel if they sought it. And therefore, in a while, he was given leave to go freely about the land. And it seemed to Manwe that the evil of Melkor was cured, for Manwe was free from evil and could not comprehend it. And he knew that in the beginning, in the thought of Ilovata, Melkor had been even as he, and he saw not to the depths of Melkor's heart, and did not perceive that all love had departed from him forever. But Ulmo was not deceived, and Tulkas clenched his hands whenever he saw Melkor his foe go by. For if Tulkas is slow to wrath, he is slow also to forget. But they obeyed the judgment of Manwe, for those who will defend authority against rebellion must not themselves rebel. Now in his heart Melkor most hated the Eldar, both because they were fair and joyful, and because in them he saw the reason for the arising of the Valar and his own downfall. Therefore, all the more did he feign love for them and seek their friendship, and he offered them the service of his lord and labor in any great deed that they would do. The Vanya indeed held him in suspicion, for they dwelt in the light of the trees and were content. And to the Tuleri he gave small heed, thinking them of little worth, tools too weak for his designs. But the Noldor took delight in the hidden knowledge that he could reveal to them, and some hearkened to words that it would have been better for them never to have heard. Melkor indeed declared afterwards that Feanor had learned much art from him in secret and had been instructed by him in the greatest of all his works. But he lied in his lust and his envy, for none of the Elderlier ever hated Melkor more than Feanor, son of Finwë, who first named him Morgoth. And snared though he was in the webs of Melkor's malice against the Valar, he held no converse with him and took no counsel from him. For Feanor was driven by the fire of his own heart only, working ever swiftly and alone, and he asked the aid and sought the counsel of none that dwelt in Ammon, great or small, save only and for a little while of Nerdanel the wise, his wife. Of the Silmarils and the Unrest of the Noldor In that time were made those things that afterwards were most renowned of all the works of the elves. For Feanor, being come to his full might, was filled with a new thought, or it may be that some shadow of foreknowledge came to him of the doom that drew near, and he pondered how the light of the trees, the glory of the blessed realm, might be preserved imperishable. Then he began a long and secret labour, and he summoned all his lore and his powers, and his subtle skill, and at the end of all he made the Silmarils. As three great jewels they were in form. But not until the end, when Feanor shall return, who perished ere the sun was made, and sits now in the halls of awaiting, and comes no more among his kin. Not until the sun passes and the moon falls shall it be known of what substance they were made. Like the crystal of diamonds it appeared, and yet was more strong than adamant, so that no violence could mar it or break it within the kingdom of Arda. Yet that crystal was to the Silmarils, but as is the body to the children of Ilovata, the house of its inner fire that is within it, and yet in all parts of it, and is its life. And the inner fire of the Silmarils Feanor made of the blended light of the trees of Valinor, which lives in them yet, though the trees have long withered and shine no more. Therefore, even in the darkness of the deepest treasury, the Silmarils of their own radiance shone like the stars of Varda. And yet, as were they indeed living things, they rejoiced in light and received it, and gave it back in hues more marvellous than before. All who dwelt in Aman were filled with wonder and delight at the work of Feanor. And Varda hallowed the Silmarils, 
so that thereafter no mortal flesh, nor hands unclean, nor anything of evil will might touch them, but it was scorched and withered. And Mandos foretold that the fates of Arda, earth, sea, and air lay locked within them. The heart of Feanor was fast bound to these things that he himself had made. Then Melkor lusted for the Silmarils, and the very memory of their radiance was a gnawing fire in his heart. From that time forth, inflamed by this desire, he sought ever more eagerly how he should destroy Feanor and end the friendship of the Valar and the elves. But he dissembled his purposes with cunning, and nothing of his malice could yet be seen in the semblance that he wore. Long was he at work, and slow at first, and barren was his labour. But he that sows lies in the end shall not lack of a harvest, and soon he may rest from toil indeed while others reap and sow in his stead. Ever Melkor found some ears that would hear him, and some tongues that would enlarge what they had heard. And his lies passed from friend to friend, the secrets of which the knowledge proves the teller wise. Bitterly did the Noldor atone for the folly of their open ears in the days that followed after. When he saw that many leaned towards him, Melkor would often walk among them, and amid his fair words others were woven, so subtly, that many who heard them believed in recollection that they arose from their own thought. Visions he would conjure in their hearts of the mighty realms that they could have ruled at their own will, in power and freedom in the East and then whispers went abroad that the Valar had brought the Eldar to Ammon because of their jealousy, fearing that the beauty of the Quendi and the Maker's power that Ilovata had bequeathed to them would grow too great for the Valar to govern as the elves waxed and spread over the wide lands of the world. In those days, moreover, though the Valar knew indeed of the coming of men that were to be, the elves as yet knew naught of it for Manwe had not revealed it to them. But Melkor spoke to them in secret of mortal men, seeing how the silence of the Valar might be twisted to evil. Little he knew yet concerning men, for engrossed with his own thought in the music, he had paid small heed to the third theme of Ilovata. But now the whisper went among the elves that Manwe held them captive, so that men might come and supplant them in the kingdoms of Middle-earth. For the Valar saw that they might more easily sway this short-lived and weaker race, defrauding the elves of the inheritance of Iluvata. Small truth was there in this, and little have the Valar ever prevailed to sway the wills of men. But many of the Noldor believed, or half-believed, the evil words." Thus, ere the Valar were aware, the peace of Valinor was poisoned. The Noldor began to murmur against them, and many became filled with pride, forgetting how much of what they had and knew came to them in gift from the Valar. Fiercest burned the new flame of desire for freedom and wider realms in the eager heart of Feanor. And Melkor laughed in his secrecy, for to that mark his lies had been addressed, hating Feanor above all, and lusting ever for the Silmarils. But these he was not suffered to approach, for though at great feasts Feanor would wear them blazing on his brow, at other times they were guarded close, locked in the deep chambers of his hoard in Tyrion. For Feanor began to love the Silmarils with a greedy love, and grudged the sight of them to all, save to his father and his seven sons he seldom remembered now that the light within them was not his own. High princes were Feanor and Filgolfin, the elder sons of Finwë, honoured by all in Aman. But now they grew proud and jealous each of his rights and his possessions. Then Melkor set new lies abroad in Eldamar, and whispers came to Feanor that Fingolfin and his sons were plotting to usurp the leadership of Fenwë, and of the elder line of Feanor, and to supplant them by the leave of the Valar. For the Valar were ill-pleased that the Silmarils lay in Tyrion, and were not committed to their keeping. But to Fingolfin and Finarfin it was said, Beware! Small love has the proud son of Miriel ever had for the children of Indis. 
Now he has become great, and he has his father in his hand. It will not be long before he drives you forth from Tuna. And when Melkor saw that these lies were smouldering, and that pride and anger were awake among the Noldor, he spoke to them concerning weapons. And in that time the Noldor began the smithying of swords and axes and spears. Shields also they made, displaying the tokens of many houses and kindreds that vied one with another, and these only they wore abroad, and of other weapons they did not speak, for each believed that he alone had received the warning. And Feanor made a secret forge, of which not even Melkor was aware, and there he tempered fell swords for himself and for his sons, and made tall helms with plumes of red. Bitterly did Matan rue the day when he taught to the husband of Nerdunel all the lore of metalwork that he had learned of Aule. Thus with lies and evil whisperings and false counsel, Melkor kindled the hearts of the Noldor to strife, and of their quarrels came at length the end of the high days of Valinor, and the evening of its ancient glory. For Feanor now began openly to speak words of rebellion against the Valar, crying aloud that he would depart from Valinor back to the world without, and would deliver the Noldor from thraldom if they would follow him. Then there was great unrest in Tyrion, and Finwë was troubled, and he summoned all his lords to council. But Fingolfin hastened to his halls and stood before him, saying, King and father, wilt thou not restrain the pride of our brother, Corufinwe, who is called the Spirit of Fire all too truly? By what right does he speak for all our people as if he were king? Thou it was who long ago spoke before the Quendi, bidding them accept the summons of the Valar to Amon. Thou it was that led the Noldor upon the road through the perils of Middle-earth to the light of Eldamar. If thou dost not now repent of it, Two sons at least thou hast to honour thy words. But even as Fingolfin spoke, Feanor strode into the chamber, and he was fully armed, his high helm upon his head, and at his side a mighty sword. So it is, even as I guessed, he said. My half-brother would be before me with my father in this as in all other matters. Then turning upon Fingolfin, he drew his sword, crying, Get thee gone, and take thy due place. Fingolfin bowed before Finwë, and without word or glance to Feanor, he went from the chamber. But Feanor followed him, and at the door of the king's house he stayed him, and on the point of his bright sword he set against Fingolfin's breast. See, half-brother, he said, this is sharper than thy tongue. Try but once more to usurp my place and the love of my father, and maybe it will rid the Noldor of one who seeks to be the master of thralls. These words were heard by many, for the house of Finwë was in the great square beneath the Mindon. But again Fingolfin made no answer, and passing through the throng in silence, he went to seek Finarfin, his brother. Now the unrest of the Noldor was not indeed hidden from the Valar, but its seed had been sown in the dark, and therefore, since Feanor first openly spoke against them, they judged that he was the mover of discontent, being eminent in self-will and arrogance, though all the Noldor had become proud. And Manwë was grieved, but he watched and said no word. The Valar had brought the Eldar to their land freely, to dwell or to depart, and though they might judge departure to be folly, they might not restrain them from it. But now the deeds of Feanor could not be passed over, and the Valar were angered and dismayed, and he was summoned to appear before them at the gates of Valmar to answer for all his words and deeds. There also were summoned all others who had any part in this matter, or any knowledge of it. And Feanor, standing before Mandos in the Ring of Doom, was commanded to answer all that was asked of him, then at last the root was laid bare, and the malice of Melkor revealed, and straightway Tulkas left the council to lay hands upon him and bring him again to judgment. But Feanor was not held guiltless, 
for he it was that had broken the peace of Valinor and drawn his sword upon his kinsmen. And Mandos said to him, Thou speakest of thraldom. If thraldom it be, thou canst not escape it, for Manwe is king of Arda, and not of Aman only, and this deed was unlawful, whether in Aman or not in Aman. Therefore this doom is now made. For twelve years thou shalt leave Tyrion, where this threat was uttered. In that time, take counsel with thyself, and remember who and what thou art. But after that time, this matter shall be set in peace, and held redressed if others will release thee. Then Fingolfin said, I will release my brother. But Feanor spoke no word in answer, standing silent before the Valar. Then he turned and left the council, and departed from Valmar. With him into banishment went his seven sons, and northward in Valinor they made a strong place and treasury in the hills, and there at Forminos a multitude of gems were laid in hoard, and weapons also, and the Silmarils were shut in a chamber of iron. Thither also came Finwë the king, because of the love that he bore to Feanor, and Fingolfin ruled the Noldor in Tyrion. Thus the lies of Melkor were made true in seeming. Though Feanor by his own deeds had brought this thing to pass, and the bitterness that Melkor had sown endured, and lived still long afterwards between the sons of Fingolfin and Feanor. Now Melkor, knowing that his devices had been revealed, hid himself, and passed from place to place as a cloud in the hills, and Tulkas sought for him in vain. Then it seemed to the people of Valinor that the light of the trees was dimmed, and the shadows of all standing things grew longer and darker in that time. It is told that for a time Melkor was not seen again in Valinor, nor was any rumour heard of him, until suddenly he came to Forminos and spoke with Feanor before his doors. Friendship, he feigned, with cunning argument, urging him to his former thought of flight from the trammels of the Valar, and he said, Behold the truth of all that I have spoken, and how thou art banished unjustly. But if the heart of Feanor is yet free and bold as were his words in Tyrion, then I will aid him, and bring him far from this narrow land. For am I not Valar also? Yea, and more than those who sit in pride in Valimar, and I have ever been a friend to the Noldor, most skilled and most valiant of the people of Arda. Now Feanor's heart was still bitter at his humiliation before Mandos, and he looked at Melkor in silence, pondering if indeed he might yet trust him so far as to aid him in his flight. And Melkor, seeing that Feanor wavered, and knowing that the Silmarils held his heart in thrall, said at the last, Here is a strong place and well guarded. But think not that the Silmarils will lie safe in any treasury within the realm of the Valar. But his cunning overreached his aim, his words touched too deep, and awoke a fire more fierce than he designed. And Feanor looked upon Melkor with eyes that burned through his fair semblance and pierced the cloaks of his mind, perceiving there his fierce lust for the Silmarils. Then hate overcame Feanor's fear, and he cursed Melkor and bade him be gone, saying, Get thee gone from my gate, thou jail-crow of Mandos. And he shut the doors of his house in the face of the mightiest of all the dwellers in Ea. Then Melkor departed in shame, for he was himself in peril, and he saw not his time yet for revenge, but his heart was black with anger. And Finwë was filled with great fear, and in haste he sent messengers to Manwë in Valmar. Now the Valar was sitting in council before their gates, fearing the lengthening of the shadows, when the messengers came from Formenos. At once Orome and Tulka sprang up, but even as they set out in pursuit, Messengers came from Eldamar, telling that Melkor had fled through the Kalikiria, and from the hill of Tunar the elves had seen him pass in wrath as a thundercloud. And they said 
that Densi had turned northward, for the Teleri in Alqualonde had seen his shadow going by their haven towards Araman. Thus Melkor departed from Valinor, and for a while the two trees shone again unshadowed, and the land was filled with light. But the Valar sought in vain for tidings of their enemy. And as a cloud far off that looms ever higher, borne upon a slow, cold wind, a doubt now marred the joy of all the dwellers in Ammon, dreading they knew not what evil that yet might come. Of the Darkening of Valinor When Manwe heard of the ways that Melkor had taken, it seemed plain to him that he purposed to escape to his old strongholds in the north of Middle-earth, and Orome and Tulkas went with all speed northward, seeking to overtake him if they might. But they found no trace or rumor of him beyond the shores of the Teleri, in the unpeopled wastes that drew near to the ice. Thereafter, the watch was redoubled along the northern fences of Aman, but to no purpose. For ere the pursuit set out, Melkor had turned back, and in secrecy passed away far to the south. For he was yet as one of the Valar, and could change his form, or walk unclad, as could his brethren, though that power he was soon to lose forever. Thus, unseen, he came at last to the dark region of Avathar. That narrow land lay south of the Bay of Eldamar, beneath the eastern feet of the Pelori, and its long and mournful shores stretched away into the south, lightless and unexplored. There beneath the sheer walls of the mountains and the cold, dark sea, the shadows were deepest and thickest in the world. And there, in Avatar, secret and unknown, Ungoliant made her abode. The Eldar knew not whence she came, but some have said that in ages long before she descended from the darkness that lies about Arda, when Melkor first looked down in envy upon the kingdom of Manwe, and that in the beginning she was one of those that he corrupted to his service. But she had disowned her master, desiring to be mistress of her own lust, taking all things to herself to feed her emptiness. And she fled to the south, escaping the assaults of the Valar and the hunters of Orome, for their vigilance had ever been to the north, and the south was long unheeded. Thence she had crept towards the light of the blessed realm, for she hungered for light and hated it. In the ravine she lived, and took shape as a spider of monstrous form, weaving her black webs in a cleft of the mountains. There she sucked up all light that she could find, and spun it forth again in dark nets of strangling gloom, until no light more could come to her abode, and she was famished. Now Melkor came to Avatar and sought her out, and he put on again the form that he had worn as the tyrant of Utumno, a dark lord, tall and terrible. In that form he remained ever after. There in the black shadows beyond the sight even of Manwe in his highest halls, Melkor with Ungoliant plotted his revenge. But when Ungoliant understood the purpose of Melkor, she was torn between lust and great fear, for she was loath to dare the perils of Ammon and the power of the dreadful lords, and she would not stir from her hiding. Therefore Melkor said to her, Do as I bid. And if thou hunger still when all is done, then I will give thee whatsoever thy lust may demand, yea, with both hands. Lightly he made this vow, as he ever did, and he laughed in his heart. Thus did the great thief set his lure for the lesser. A cloak of darkness she wove about them when Melkor and Ungoliant set forth. An unlight in which things seemed to be no more, and which eyes could not pierce, for it was void. Then slowly she wrought her webs, rope by rope, from cleft to cleft, from jutting rock to pinnacle of stone, ever climbing upwards, crawling and clinging, until at last she reached the very summit 
of Hayamentir, the highest mountain in that region of the world, far south of Great Taniquetil. There the Valar were not vigilant, for west of the Pelori was an empty land in twilight, and eastward the mountains looked out, save for forgotten Avathar, only upon the dim waters of the pathless sea. But now upon the mountain top, dark, ungolliant lay, and she made a ladder of woven ropes and cast it down, and Melkor climbed upon it and came to that high place and stood beside her, looking down upon the guarded realm. Below them lay the woods of Oreme, and westward shimmered the fields and pastures of Yavanna, gold beneath the tall wheat of the gods. But Melkor looked north, and saw afar the shining plain and the silver domes of Valmar gleaming in the mingling of the lights of Telperion and Laurelin. Then Melkor laughed aloud, and leapt swiftly down the long western slopes, and Ungoliant was at his side, and her darkness covered them. Now it was a time of festival, as Melkor knew well. Though all tides and seasons were at the will of the Valar, and in Valinor there was no winter of death, nonetheless they dwelt then in the kingdom of Arda, and that was but a small realm in the halls of Ea, whose life is time, which flows ever from the first note to the last chord of Eru. And even as it was then the delight of the Valar, as is told in the Ainolindela, to clothe themselves as in a vesture in the forms of the children of Iluvata, so also did they eat and drink, and gather the fruits of Yavanna from the earth which under Eru they had made. Therefore Yavanna set times for the flowering and the ripening of all things that grew in Valinor, and at each first gathering of fruits Manwe made a high feast for the praising of Eru, when all the peoples of Valinor poured forth their joy in music and song upon Tani Quetu. This now was the hour. Manwe decreed a feast more glorious than any that had been held since the coming of the Eldar to Amman. For though the escape of Melkor portended toils and sorrows to come, and indeed none could tell what further hurts would be done to Arda ere he could be subdued again, at this time Manwe designed to heal the evil that had arisen among the Noldor and all were bidden to come to his halls upon Taniquetil, there to put aside the griefs that lay between their princes, and forget utterly the lies of their enemy. There came the Vanya, and there came the Noldor of Tyrion, and the Maya were gathered together, and the Valar were arrayed in their beauty and majesty, and they sang before Manwe and Varda in their lofty halls, or danced upon the green slopes of the mountain, that looked west towards the trees. In that day, the streets of Valmar were empty, and the stairs of Tyrion were silent, and all the land lay sleeping in peace. Only the Teleri beyond the mountains still sang upon the shores of the sea, for they recked little of seasons or times, and gave no thought to the cares of the rulers of Arda, or the shadow that had fallen on Valinor, for it had not touched them as yet. One thing only marred the design of Manwe. Feanor came indeed, for him alone Manwe had commanded to come. But Finwe came not, nor any others of the Noldor of Formenos. For said Finwe, While the ban lasts upon Feanor, my son, that he may not go to Tyrion, I hold myself unkinged and I will not meet my people. And Feanor came not in raiment of festival, and he wore no ornament, neither silver nor gold nor any gem, and he denied the sight of the Silmarils to the Valar and the Eldar, and left them locked in Formenos in their chamber of iron. Nevertheless, he met Fingolfin before the throne of Manwe, and was reconciled in word. And Fingolfin set at naught the unsheathing of the sword, for Fingolfin held forth his hand, saying, As I promised, I do now. I release thee, and remember no grievance. Then Feanor took his hand in silence. But Fingolfin said, Half-brother in blood, full-brother in heart will I be. Thou shalt lead, and I will follow. 
May no new grief divide us. I hear thee, said Feanor. So be it. But they did not know the meaning that their words would bear. It is told that even as Feanor and Fingolfin stood before Manwë, there came the mingling of the lights when both trees were shining, and the silent city of Valmar was filled with a radiance of silver and gold. And in that very hour, Melkor and Ungoliant came hastening over the fields of Valinor, as the shadow of a black cloud upon the wind fleets over the sunlit earth. And they came before the green mound Ezolaha. Then the unlight of Ungoliant rose up even to the roots of the trees, and Melkor sprang upon the mound, and with his black spear he smote each tree to its core, wounding them deep. And their sap poured forth as it were their blood, and was spilled upon the ground. But Ungoliant sucked it up, and going then from tree to tree, she set her black beak to their wounds till they were drained. And the poison of death that was in her went into their tissues and withered them root, branch, and leaf, and they died. And still she thirsted, and going to the wells of Varda, she drank them dry. But Ungoliant belched forth black vapors as she drank, and swelled to a shape so vast and hideous that Melkor was afraid. So the great darkness fell upon Valinor. Of the deeds of that day, much is told in the Aldudania that Elomira of the Vanyar made and is known to all the Eldar. Yet no song or tale could contain all the grief and terror that then befell. The light failed, but the darkness that followed was more than loss of light. In that hour was made a darkness that seemed not lack, but a thing with being of its own. For it was indeed made by malice out of light, and it had power to pierce the eye and to enter heart and mind and strangle the very will. Varda looked down from Taniquetil and beheld the shadow soaring up in sudden towers of gloom. Valmar had foundered in a deep sea of night. Soon the holy mountain stood alone, a last island in a world that was drowned. All song ceased. There was silence in Valinor, and no sound could be heard, save only from afar there came on the wind through the pass of the mountains the wailing of the Tileri like the cold cry of gulls. For it blew chill from the east in that hour, and the vast shadows of the sea were rolled against the walls of the shore. But Manwe, from his high seat, looked out, and his eyes alone pierced through the night, until they saw a darkness beyond dark, which they could not penetrate, huge but far away, moving now northward with great speed, and he knew that Melkor had come and gone. Then the pursuit was begun, and the earth shook beneath the horses of the host of Orime, and the fire that was stricken from the hooves of Naha was the first light that returned to Valinor. But so soon as any came up with the cloud of Ungoliant, the riders of the Valar were blinded and dismayed, and they were scattered, and went they knew not whither. And the sound of the Valaroma faltered and failed, and Tulkas was as one caught in a black net at night, and he stood powerless and beat the air in vain. But when the darkness had passed, it was too late. Melkor had gone whither he would, and his vengeance was achieved. Of the Flight of the Noldor After a time, a great concourse gathered about the Ring of Doom, and the Valar sat in shadow, for it was night. But the stars of Varda now glimmered overhead, and the air was clear, for the winds of Manwë had driven away the vapours of death and rolled back the shadows of the sea. Then Yavanna arose and stood upon Ezeloha, the green mound. But it was bare now and black, and she laid her hands upon the trees, but they were dead and dark, and each branch that she touched broke and fell lifeless at her feet. 
Then many voices were lifted in lamentation, and it seemed to those that mourned that they had drained to the dregs the cup of woe that Melkor had filled for them. But it was not so. Yavanna spoke before the Valar, saying, The light of the trees has passed away, and lives now only in the Silmarils of Feanor. Foresighted was he. Even for those who are mightiest under Ilovata, there is some work that they may accomplish once, and once only. The light of the trees I brought into being, and within Ea I can do so never again. Yet had I but a little of that light, I could recall life to the trees ere their roots decay, and then our hurt should be healed, and the malice of Melkor be confounded. Then Manwe spoke and said, Hearest thou, Feanor, son of Finwe, the words of Yavanna? Wilt thou grant what she would ask? There was long silence, but Feanor answered no word. Then Tulkas cried, Speak, O Noldo, yea or nay, but who shall deny Yavanna? And did not the light of the Silmarils come from her work in the beginning? But Aula, the maker, said, Be not hasty. We ask a greater thing than thou knowest. Let him have peace yet a while. But Feanor spoke then and cried bitterly, For the less, even as for the greater, there is some deed that he may accomplish but once only, and in that deed his heart shall rest. It may be that I can unlock my jewels, but never again shall I make their like. And if I must break them, I shall break my heart, and I shall be slain, first of all the elder in Ammon. Not the first said Mandos. But they did not understand his word, and again there was silence, while Feanor brooded in the dark. It seemed to him that he was beset in a ring of enemies, and the words of Melkor returned to him, saying that the Silmarils were not safe if the Valar would possess them. And is he not Valar as they? said his thought. And does he not understand their hearts? Yea, a thief shall reveal thieves. Then he cried aloud, This thing I will not do of free will. But if the Valar will constrain me, then shall I know indeed that Melkor is of their kindred. Then Mandos said, Thou hast spoken. And Niena arose and went up unto Ezeloha and cast back her grey hood and with her tears washed away the defilements of Ungoliant, and she sang in mourning for the bitterness of the world and the marring of Arda. But even as Niena mourned, there came messengers from Formenos, and they were Noldor and bore new tidings of evil, for they told how a blind darkness came northward, and in the midst walked some power for which there was no name, and the darkness issued from it. But Melkor also was there, and he came to the house of Feanor, and there he slew Finwë, king of the Noldor, before his doors, and spilled the first blood in the blessed realm. For Finwë alone had not fled from the horror of the dark. And they told that Melkor had broken the stronghold of Formenos, and taken all the jewels of the Noldor that were hoarded in that place, and the Silmarils were gone. Then Feanor rose, and lifting up his hand before Manwë, he cursed Melkor, naming him Morgoth, the black foe of the world, and by that name only he was known to the Eldar ever after. And he cursed also the summons of Manwë, and the hour in which he came to Tani Quetil, thinking in the madness of his rage and grief, that had he been at Formenos, his strength would have availed more than to be slain also, as Melkor had purposed. Then Feanor ran from the Ring of Doom and fled into the night, for his father was dearer to him than the light of Valinor or the peerless work of his hands. And who among sons of elves or of men have held their fathers of greater worth? Many there grieved for the anguish of Feanor, but his loss was not his alone. 
and Yavanna wept by the mound, in fear that the darkness should swallow the last rays of the light of Valinor forever. For though the Valar did not yet understand fully what had befallen, they perceived that Melkor had called upon some aid that came from beyond Arda. The Silmarils had passed away, and all one it may seem whether Feanor had said yea or nay to Yavanna. Yet had he said yea at the first, before the tidings came from Formenos, it may be that his after deeds would have been other than they were. But now the doom of the Noldor drew near. Meanwhile, Morgoth, escaping from the pursuit of the Valar, came to the wastes of Araman. This land lay northward between the mountains of the Pelori and the Great Sea, as Avathar lay to the south. But Araman was a wider land, and between the shores and the mountains were barren plains, ever colder as the ice drew nearer. Through this region, Morgoth and Ungoliant passed in haste, and so came through the great mists of Oyamure to the Hel Karaxa, where the strait between Araman and Middle-earth was filled with grinding ice. And he crossed over, and came back at last to the north of the Outer Lands. Together they went on, for Morgoth could not elude Ungoliant. And her cloud was still about him, and all her eyes were upon him. And they came to those lands that lay north of the Firth of Drengist. Now Morgoth was drawing near to the ruins of Angband, where his great western stronghold had been. And Ungoliant perceived his hope, and knew that here he would seek to escape from her, and she stayed him, demanding that he fulfil his promise. Black heart, she said, I have done thy bidding, but I hunger still. What wouldst thou have more? said Morgoth. Dost thou desire all the world for thy belly? I did not vow to give thee that. I am its lord. Not so much, said Ungoliant. But thou hast a great treasure from Formenos. I will have all that. Yea, with both hands thou shalt give it. Then perforce, Morgoth surrendered to her the gems that he bore with him, one by one, and grudgingly. And she devoured them, and their beauty perished from the world. Huger and darker yet grew ungoliant, but her lust was unsated. With one hand thou givest, she said. With the left only, open thy right hand. In his right hand, Morgoth held close the Silmarils, and though they were locked in a crystal casket, they had begun to burn him, and his hand was clenched in pain, but he would not open it. Nay, he said, thou hast had thy due. For with my power that I put into thee, thy work was accomplished. I need thee no more. These things thou shalt not have, nor see. I name them unto myself forever. But Ungoliant had grown great, and he less by the power that had gone out of him. And she rose against him, and her cloud closed about him, and she enmeshed him in a web of clinging thongs to strangle him. Then Morgoth sent forth a terrible cry that echoed in the mountains. Therefore, that region was called Lamoth. For the echoes of his voice dwelt there ever after, so that any who cried aloud in that land awoke them, and all the waste between the hills and the sea was filled with a clamor as of voices in anguish. The cry of Morgoth in that hour was the greatest and most dreadful that was ever heard in the northern world. The mountains shook, and the earth trembled, and the rocks were riven asunder. Deep in forgotten places that cry was heard. Far beneath the ruined halls of Angband, in vaults to which the Valar, in the haste of their assault, had not descended, Balrogs lurked still, awaiting ever the return of their lord. And now swiftly they arose, and passing over Hithlam, they came to Lamoth as a tempest of fire. With their whips of flame, they smote asunder the webs of Ungoliant, and she quailed and turned to flight, belching black vapors to cover her. And fleeing from the north, she went down into Beleriand, and dwelt beneath Ered Gorgoroth in that dark valley that was after called Nan Dungortheb, 
the Valley of Dreadful Death, because of the horror that she bred there. For other foul creatures of spider form had dwelt there since the days of the delving of Angband, and she mated with them and devoured them. And even after Ungoliant herself departed and went whither she would into the forgotten south of the world, her offspring abode there and wove their hideous webs. Of the fate of Ungoliant no tale tells, yet some have said that she ended long ago, when in her uttermost famine she devoured herself at last. And thus the fear of Yavanna that the Silmarils would be swallowed up and fall into nothingness did not come to pass. But they remained in the power of Morgoth, and he being freed, gathered again all his servants that he could find, and came to the ruins of Angband. There he delved anew his vast vaults and dungeons, and above their gates he reared the threefold peaks of Thangorodrim, and a great reek of dark smoke was ever wreathed about them. There countless became the hosts of his beasts and his demons, and the race of the orcs, bred long before, grew and multiplied in the bowels of the earth. Dark now fell the shadow on Beleriand, as is told hereafter. But in Angband, Morgoth forged for himself a great crown of iron, and he called himself King of the World. In token of this he set the Silmarils in his crown. His hands were burned black by the touch of those hallowed jewels, and black they remained ever after, nor was he ever free from the pain of the burning and the anger of the pain. That crown he never took from his head, though its weight became a deadly weariness. Never but once only did he depart for a while secretly from his domain in the north. Seldom, indeed, did he leave the deep places of his fortress, but governed his armies from his northern throne. And once only, also, did he himself wield weapon while his realm lasted. For now, more than in the days of Otumno, ere his pride was humbled, his hatred devoured him. And in the domination of his servants, and the inspiring of them with lust of evil, he spent his spirit. Nonetheless, his majesty as one of the Valar long remained, though turned to terror, and before his face all save the mightiest sank into a dark pit of fear. Now when it was known that Morgoth had escaped from Valinor, and pursuit was unavailing, the Valar remained long seated in darkness in the Ring of Doom, and the Maya and the Vanya stood beside them and wept. But the Noldor, for the most part, returned to Tyrion, and mourned for the darkening of their fair city. Through the dim ravine of the Calakiria, fogs drifted in from the shadowy seas and mantled its towers, and the lamp of the Mindon burned pale in the gloom. Then suddenly Feanor appeared in the city, and called on all to come to the high court of the king upon the summit of Tunar. But the doom of banishment that had been laid upon him was not yet lifted, and he rebelled against the Valar. A great multitude gathered swiftly, therefore, to hear what he would say, and the hill and all the stairs and streets that climbed upon it were lit with the light of many torches that each one bore in hand. Feanor was a master of words, and his tongue had great power over hearts when he would use it, and that night he made a speech before the Noldor which they ever remembered. Fierce and fell were his words, and filled with anger and pride, and hearing them the Noldor were stirred to madness. His wrath and his hate were given most to Morgoth, and yet well nigh all that he said came from the very lies of Morgoth himself. But he was distraught with grief for the slaying of his father, and with anguish for the rape of the Silmarils. He claimed now the kingship of all the Noldor, since Finwë was dead, and he scorned the decrees of the Valar. Why, O people of the Noldor, he cried, why should we longer serve the jealous Valar, who cannot keep us nor even their own realm secure from their enemy? And though he be now their foe, are not they and he of one kin? Vengeance calls me hence. But even were it otherwise, I would not dwell longer in the same land with the kin of my father's slayer, 
and of the thief of my treasure. Yet I am not the only valiant in this valiant people. And have ye not all lost your king? And what else have ye not lost, cooped here in a narrow land between the mountains and the sea? Here once was light, that the Valar begrudged to Middle-earth, but now dark levels all. Shall we mourn here, deedless for ever, a shadow folk, mist-haunting, dropping vain tears in the thankless sea? Or shall we return to our home? In Quivienen sweet ran the waters under unclouded stars, and wide lands lay about, where a free people might walk. There they lie still, and await us who in our folly forsook them. Come away. Let the cowards keep the city. Long he spoke, and ever he urged the Noldor to follow him, and by their own prowess to win freedom and great realms in the lands of the east before it was too late. For he echoed the lies of Melkor, that the Valar had cousined them, and would hold them captive, so that men might rule in Middle-earth. Many of the Eldar heard then, for the first time, of the aftercomers. Fair shall the end be, he cried, though long and hard shall be the road. Say farewell to bondage, but say farewell also to ease. Say farewell to the weak, say farewell to your treasures. More still shall we make. Journey light, but bring with you your swords, for we will go further than Orimer, endure longer than Tulkas. We will never turn back from pursuit. After Morgoth, to the ends of the earth, war shall he have, and hatred undying. But when we have conquered and have regained the Silmarils, then... We and we alone shall be lords of the unsullied light and masters of the bliss and beauty of Arda. No other race shall oust us. Then Feanor swore a terrible oath. His seven sons leapt straightway to his side and took the selfsame vow together, and red as blood shone their drawn swords in the glare of the torches. They swore an oath which none shall break, and none should take, by the name even of Iluvata, calling the everlasting dark upon them if they kept it not. And Manwe they named in witness, and Varda, and the hallowed mountain of Taniquetu, vowing to pursue with vengeance and hatred to the ends of the world, Vala, demon, elf, or man as yet unborn, or any creature, great or small, good or evil, the time should bring forth unto the end of days, whoso should hold or take or keep a Silmaril from their possession. Thus spoke Mythros and Maglor and Kelagorm, Kurufin and Caranthia, Amrod and Amras, princes of the Noldor, and many quailed to hear the dread words. For so sworn, good or evil, an oath may not be broken, and it shall pursue oath-keeper and oath-breaker to the world's end. Fingolfin and Turgon, his son, therefore spoke against Feanor, and fierce words awoke, so that once again wrath came near to the edge of swords. But Finarfin spoke softly, as was his wont, and sought to calm the Noldor, persuading them to pause and ponder ere deeds were done that could not be undone. And Orodreth alone of his sons spoke in like manner. Finrod was with Torgon, his friend. But Galadriel, the only woman of the Noldor to stand that day tall and valiant among the contending princes, was eager to be gone. No oath she swore, but the words of Feanor concerning Middle-earth had kindled in her heart for she yearned to see the wide, unguarded lands, and to rule there a realm at her own will. Of like mind with Galadriel was Fingon, Fingolfin's son, being moved also by Feanor's words, though he loved him little. And with Fingon stood, as they ever did, Angrod and Aegnor, sons of Finarfin. 
But these held their peace and spoke not against their fathers. At length, after long debate, Feanor prevailed, and the greater part of the Noldor there assembled, he set aflame with the desire of new things and strange countries. Therefore, when Finarfin spoke yet again for heed and delay, a great shout went up, Nay, let us be gone. And straightway, Feanor and his sons began to prepare for the marching forth. Little foresight could there be for those who dared to take so dark a road. Yet all was done in over-haste, for Feanor drove them on, fearing lest in the cooling of their hearts his words should wane and other counsels yet prevail. And for all his proud words, he did not forget the power of the Valar. But from Valmar no message came, and Manwe was silent. He would not yet either forbid or hinder Feanor's purpose, for the Valar were aggrieved that they were charged with evil intent to the Eldar, or that any were held captive by them against their will. Now they watched and waited, for they did not yet believe that Feanor could hold the host of the Noldor to his will. And indeed, when Feanor began the marshalling of the Noldor for their setting out, then at once dissension arose. For though he had brought the assembly in a mind to depart, by no means all were of a mind to take Feanor as king. Greater love was given to Fingolfin and his sons, and his household and the most part of the dwellers in Tyrion refused to renounce him, if he would go with them. And thus, at the last, as two divided hosts, the Noldor set forth upon their bitter road. Feanor and his following were in the van, but the greater host came behind under Fingolfin, and he marched against his wisdom, because Fingon his son so urged him, and because he would not be sundered from his people that were eager to go, nor leave them to the rash counsels of Feanor. Nor did he forget his words before the throne of Manwe. With Fingolfin went Finarfin also, and for like reasons, but most loath was he to depart. And of all the Noldor in Valinor, who were grown now to a great people, but one tithe refused to take the road. Some for the love that they bore to the Valar, and to Aule, not least. Some for the love of Tyrion and the many things that they had made. None for fear of peril by the way. But even as the trumpet sang and Feanor issued from the gates of Tyrion, a messenger came at last from Manwe, saying, Against the folly of Feanor shall be set my counsel only. Go not forth, for the hour is evil, and your road leads to sorrow that ye do not foresee. No aid will the Valar lend you in this quest, but neither will they hinder you. For this ye shall know, as ye came hither freely, freely shall ye depart. But thou, Feanor, Finway's son, by thine oath art exiled. The lies of Melkor thou shalt unlearn in bitterness. Valor he is, thou sayest. Then hast thou sworn in vain, for none of the Valar canst thou overcome now, or ever within the halls of Ea, not though Eru, whom thou namest, had made thee thrice greater than thou art. But Feanor laughed, and spoke not to the herald, but to the Noldor, saying, So, then will this valiant people send forth the heir of their king alone into banishment with his sons only, and return to their bondage? But if any will come with me, I say to them, Is sorrow foreboded to you? But in Amman we have seen it. In Amman we have come through bliss to woe. The other now we will try through sorrow to find joy or freedom at the least. Then turning to the herald, he cried, Say this to Manwe Sulimo, high king of Arda. If Feanor cannot overthrow Morgoth, at least he delays not to assail him and sits not idle in grief. And it may be that Eru has set in me a fire greater than thou knowest. 
Such hurt, at the least, will I do to the foe of the Valar, that even the mighty in the Ring of Doom shall wonder to hear it. Yea, in the end, they shall follow me. Farewell. In that hour, the voice of Feanor grew so great and so potent, that even the herald of the Valar bowed before him as one full answered and departed, and the Noldor were overruled. Therefore they continued their march, and the house of Feanor hastened before them along the coasts of Elende. Not once did they turn their eyes back to Tyrion on the green hill of Tunar. Slower and less eagerly came the host of Fingolfin after them. Of those Fingon was the foremost, but at the rear went Finarfin and Finrod, and many of the noblest and wisest of the Noldor. And often they looked behind them to see their fair city, until the lamp of the Mindon Eldelieva was lost in the night. More than any others of the exiles, they carried thence memories of the bliss they had forsaken, and some even of the things that they had made there they took with them, a solace and a burden on the road. Now Feanor led the Noldor northward because his first purpose was to follow Morgoth. Moreover, Tunar beneath Tani Quetil was set nigh to the girdle of Arda, and there the great sea was immeasurably wide, whereas ever northward the sundering seas grew narrower, as the wasteland of Araman and the coasts of Middle-earth drew together. But as the mind of Feanor cooled and took counsel, he perceived over late that all these great companies would never overcome the long leagues to the north, nor cross the seas at the last, save with the aid of ships. Yet it would need long time and toil to build so great a fleet, even were there any among the Noldor skilled in that craft. He resolved now, therefore, to persuade the Teleri, ever friends to the Noldor, to join with them, and in his rebellion he thought that thus the bliss of Valinor might be further diminished, and his power for ward upon Morgoth be increased. He hastened then to Alqualonda, and spoke to the Teleri, as he had spoken before in Tyrion. But the Teleri were unmoved by aught that he could say. They were grieved indeed at the going of their kinsfolk and long friends, but would rather dissuade them than aid them, and no ship would they lend, nor help in the building against the will of the Valar. As for themselves, they desired now no other home but the strands of Eldamar, and no other lord than Olwe, prince of Alqualonde. And he had never lent ear to Morgoth, nor welcomed him to his land, and he trusted still that Ulmo and the other great among the Valar would redress the hurts of Morgoth, and that the night would pass yet to a new dawn.' 